Uh, so without further ado, uh, the first speaker is Chris Walsh. Chris has been a long time uh, University of Ma uh, Maryland um, uh, employee and uh, a very, very close uh, associate of mine and call him for many, on many occasions. And um, so anyway, Chris is going to talk to, about, talk to us about uh, tree architecture and how that kind of meshes with rootstocks, the newer rootstocks that are, that are on board. And um, without further ado, Chris. Okay. Um, this has got to be a difficult meeting to plan for because I know some of you pretty much only do small fruits. Other people, if they do tree fruit, they may only do peaches. Um, I'm going to do about a talk or a talk and a half here that relates to apples. Uh, I know that some of you, and it's kind of geared to go not just for people who've been in the business for a long period of time, but also folks who are just getting started and might be reading things and I want to kind of point out some of the issues they have. Back row, Jerome Freecon, can you hear me? Where are you already gone to sleep back there? All right, that's yeah, good. I'm on my phone. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I got started in the, in the Apple business working sort of at the end of the 1960s, the beginning of the 1970s. So what I'm going to do is sort of give a historical what I've watched over time and how the industry's changed. And that's the, the first thing we're going to look at. And this is a shot that I took in upstate New York. And you can't see it all that well in here, but um, let's see. Is that it? Yeah. I mean, we got little trees over there. We got some little ones here. We got some big ones back there. Um, all kinds of different ages and all kinds of different architectures in the orchards. In the 1970s and 1980s, a lot of people started going this way. They had trees that their parents had planted that were that size, and they were going down to that size to try to minimize the amount of hand labor that was going on. Every time you put a ladder into a tree, uh, it costs money for one way or another. And this has still been going on. I remember, I would say, Catoctin Mountain Orchard and Milburn Orchard in Maryland were the first two that I remember in the early 80s that actually got away from full-size trees and moved down into this range down in here. So size controlling rootstocks was a biggie. Um, orchard, oh my gosh, I didn't expect that to happen. I apologize. Um, in the 1960s, an old orchard in Maryland would have been red delicious and golden delicious. And it would have been planted on seedling rootstocks. In the 1980s, we jumped into new varieties like Gala and Fuji. And because Red Delicious wasn't selling, ironically, both Gala and Fuji have Red Delicious in their parentage. Uh, but a lot of people like them. There was something about Delicious that was delicious. It had a lot of sugar in it. What we wound up doing, though, is when we put Gale and Fuji onto Mauling 9 or Mauling 26 to bring the size of the trees down. We were then putting a fire blight susceptible scion onto a fire blight susceptible rootstock. And it's bad enough when you just change the rootstock. When you change the variety and the rootstock at the same time, there's a potential for all kinds of problems. So we started with things that were resistant scions and rootstocks in the 60s that were the orchards that were coming out in the 80s, and then all of a sudden, we changed the size of the trees on size-controlling rootstocks, and we put susceptible signs onto susceptible rootstocks. Uh, not enough lighting in here, but I think you can all see up around the sky here. This is actually a tree that was hit with a hailstorm in the third or fourth leaf. Hail drives fire blight into the tree, and you wind up with all kinds of shoot blight that Steiner would call that trauma blight. Okay, we have blossom blight, trauma blight, and rootstock blight, all kinds of different things and uh, possibilities in fire blight. So, whoop, go back one. All right, in the 1990s, when Paul Steiner was still alive and working here, he created a program which is still used widely for predicting when to spray for Erwinia or fire blight. And he came up with the Mary Blights uh, program. Uh, that program is still used. Do you still use it? I do. You do? Okay. Um, a lot of people still use it. 
A lot of people don't know they're using it because they use something else like Cougar Blight in Washington State, but essentially it's built on the same concepts that Steiner came up with. At the same time, people were using streptomycin, and I was talking to a guy who was a pear grower at Hershey a couple of years ago, and he said, well, I'm spraying when I see the shoots kind of curl up. Well, by then it's too late. And so the resistance strains happen because people don't spray at the right time. They also happen because sometimes nurseries have a strep resistant strain and it moves from one part of the country to another. So uh, a couple different problems, okay? Um, he also recognized that fire blight can move down through the tree and kill the roots. And a lot of people, I remember talking to Paul and he said, well, it doesn't make sense that they've got Phytophthora up on the top of a hill, on a sandy hill, so it was actually coming in through the tree, going down and killing the roots, and then the next year the tree was dying. So everyone thought, well, that's root rot, okay? You know Phytophthora root rot from growing vegetables, you know it from uh, a, a, a plants that don't tolerate it. Um, a lot of people were misdiagnosing what turned out to be rootstock blight and calling it Phytophthora, right? So, where do we have the worst problems? I pushed out two or three different research orchards where we put Gala on Mauling 9. Um, they were more susceptible and we lost more trees in them than we lost in our pear research blocks where you would think fire blight would be terrible. So when we started to try to do pedestrian orchards, we got into real trouble with uh, fire blight. Okay, uh, most of the cultivars that people really want to grow, unfortunately, do not come out of fire blight uh, programs, uh, fire blight resistance program. Probably the most profitable apple variety over the last decade has been Honeycrisp. Um, people have made a lot of money on it, getting prices up around $40 wholesale for a box a few years ago. Uh, what can we do to make things work better? Well, the best thing on the planet for people who are growing fire blight susceptible varieties is to put them on a Geneva rootstock, which is bred to be hopefully resistant to fire blight. Okay? While they don't control shoot blight, which is the fire blight you see in the orchard, they will con control rootstock blight, so you may have to prune the fire blight out of the tree, but the rootstock doesn't die, so your tree doesn't die. Okay? That's a big difference in tree mortality. So the Geneva stocks essentially follow that same pattern that I had there from the Adams County catalog. This is off the USDA ARS site. Essentially, this would be a full-size tree that would have been the Merton Balling 111 tree on the previous slide. And then they've moved down and they've gone down to things that are Malling 26 size, Malling 9 sized, and even smaller than that. So the ones that have popped up most of the time are G11, 16, 41, and 935 because folks are looking to be in that pedestrian orchard size uh, apple tree. And one of the big things, if you're, how many of you get American fruit grower? Show of hands, all right? There's always pictures of people putting in 500 to 1,000 trees to the acre with poles, wires. These trees are probably only three feet apart in the row, maybe even less, in the tall spindle system. What we did is we brought the trees down so we could do all the work from the ground, the pedestrian orchard. But when you do the arithmetic, you find out the canopy volume isn't very big. So what we've done now, or what the folks are doing now and pushing for now is tall spindles where they pull the tree in, make it a narrow cone, but they make it taller. So it's up around 12 feet. So now you're looking at having to go back up when you get up to the top wire and pick the head out of the tree and then everything else can be done from the ground, all right? No ladders, well, you may need a picking platform, but a lot of labor because the labor is in tying the trees to the wire, putting the posts in. Uh, the trees are incredibly expensive. The posts are expensive, the wire and the timing. But the goal is to stop this tree in the third leaf and get it into full production, all right? The high density systems that people are talking about with a high spindle Terrence Robinson and his disciples in upstate New York, uh, where it's relatively cool and the soils don't force a lot of tree growth, 
they're dealing with up around 1,200 trees per acre. Uh, Mike Parker down at NC State is a little bit more comfortable with about 450 trees to the acre. And I think about it as how much growth are you going to get in the first year if you plant a tree? In upstate New York, 12 inches of growth is about all they're going to get. We're going to get about 24 to 36 here. So that kind of determines why Mike Parker's rate at that and Terrence Robinson's rate at that are quite different. Okay? Because how quickly is that tree going to fill out the space? All right? I'm kind of interested, I'm kind of with Mark, Mike Parker, we have a long growing season here. How tight can we, do we really need to pack these trees in? So this is what I'd call the Brian Butler planting at Keatysville, or it's like the Brian Butler planting at Keatysville. It's a tall spindle operation. Uh, this is actually not at Keatysville. Uh, but we put in, uh, Gennaro Fazio, who's the Geneva rootstock breeder, uh, sent me a planting uh, that Luckily for me, Washington State rejected about in 2010. So it went out to Washington State, it came back again, and we put it in at Keatysville in 2010. Uh, we had trees that were shipped, just like you get them, normal way. All Geneva rootstocks, we put in a pole planting. Uh, we are running at about two paces apart, so I believe it's seven feet in the row. And this is what it looked like when, it, oh, I'm sorry, six feet by 12 feet in the row. That's what it looked like when it went in in 2010. <clears throat> I used two varieties, Gala, which is, if you put it on Mauling 9, the trees will die of rootstock blight. The other one is Crips Pink. Whoop, sorry about that. Okay, the other one is Crips Pink, which most of you know is Pink Lady. How many people, anybody grow Pink Lady? Besides Jerome? Okay, we got a few folks growing it, all right? Um, so at any rate, that's the way they went in. I'm sorry this is a little too dark. It doesn't really matter. Um, essentially, we just got a tree wall by the end of the third leaf. We took data on tree size, fruit quality, productivity, and survival. Of these four, really the one that we were interested in was survival. Productivity doesn't seem to change all that much in rootstock systems or in rootstocks. It's survival that's really the one that we really are interested in, okay? So we did yield and yield efficiency. And what yield efficiency is, is how much fruit is getting picked off how much size of trunk, all right? Uh, we did really well with Brookfield Gala on G for Geneva 935. It's not a it's more of a mauling 26 size tree than a mauling 9 size trees. Uh, there was no difference among any of the four rootstocks we had with uh, Crips Pink or AKA Pink Lady. All right? The thing that popped out of this study, and it's starting to pop with the Geneva stocks in other parts of the country, is uh, we had big problems with tree survival. All right? We had, Keatysville is a windy site. We don't have, um, poplars uh, to protect from the, uh, the west wind, and we lost a lot of trees. I think you can see a snap off here. Here's the, uh, the rootstock there, here's the scion there. It's moved about that far off. They were on wires and we still got them to snap. Didn't you have that here two summers ago with a couple of trees? Yeah, it was very minor. Very minor, but I mean, we went out, we looked at them and thought, oh, they were fire blight, and then no, it's not. It's, right. They're snapped off. Uh, you can kind of make it out here, it's laying over. These trees were tied to the wire and they still snapped off in a, a severe uh, hit, uh, storm damage. And even as the trees get bigger, we are still continuing to lose trees, all right? A picture's worth a thousand words, all right? Forget about these pictures here because they're too dark. This is the map we had. We had a four rows of Crips Pink or Pink Lady and we had four rows of Gala, all right? The picture's worth a thousand words. The red X means that tree died. So we had seven trees in a panel. We lost a couple here and a couple there on the galas. Essentially almost no tree loss with gala on Geneva stocks. Crips pink, which is a weaker growing sign variety, like honey crisp. We had 100% survival or virtually 100% survival with 202. And we had 202 from two different types of nurseries. One was 202 where it was done using the standard stool bed. The other was 202 where it was produced 
in vitro in tissue culture, micropropagated. So they were a little bit more vigorous, okay? The, both of those, nearly 100% survival. 202, again, is the uh, tree size that is a little bit closer to Mauling 26. We lost, at the time this map was done, which was two years ago, we'd lost almost 50%, 13 out of 28 trees in the plot on the Crips Pink here. Look at that plot. That was a panel of seven, all right? And if you ran the math and said how many thousand dollars you were going to make on those Crips Pink, and five out of the seven trees are gone, um, you didn't quite make as much money as you planned on. And we actually ran the math, and uh, the 202s were cranking out about $12,000 in gross receipts uh, for the time of the study. Uh, this one was down around uh, that, whatever that rootstock is, which is uh, 41. Uh, it was less, it was about half of what the other ones were. So uh, essentially it's just doing the arithmetic and borrowing the money, uh, you want to make sure the trees live. So preliminary conclusions, right? Statisticians talk about interactions. What an interaction is in this case is, does one variety on a rootstock behave the same as another variety on the same rootstock? The answer is no, all right? Whoops, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, we had essentially 100% survival on the rootstock that some people don't like because it's a little more vigorous, but it's fire, these are all fire blight resistant stocks, but our survival was greatest on four Crips Pink on uh, either, 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 um, either variety on Crips Pink. Uh, we had problems with uh, 41 in particular, which really worries me because nurseries are ramping up 41 and a lot of people are very interested in it, all right? Crips Pink is, Fire blight susceptible, and it's a weak sign, all right? Is there a trade-off? When we're going to these Geneva stocks, we have to worry about, well, yes, we've got fire blight tolerance, but are they going to survive because of environmental problems, all right? So what we're trying to do is get down, uh, 202 is a little bit larger. See, it's in the 26 size. A lot of people don't like it, but I just wonder if really weak varieties on a weak rootstock have enough photosynthate in the tree when they're putting a lot of work into making fruit to be able to make a strong enough stem and a strong enough union. So that's a question that is in my mind, but it's not just me, all right? It's not just me that's thinking about it, all right? Uh, we had the study at Keatesville, which the data is in and it's been published. Our question is, and we didn't know the answer to it, is it just a weak union? like it was with a rootstock that just snaps off? Or is it the stock, the rootstock, the, the rootstock itself that is brittle? I, I'm sorry about this. I keep hitting the wrong thing here. Is, it, is, the, is the rootstock wood itself brittle? And I'll give you an example of that. We had one tree blew out. So then the rootstock sucker came out. We didn't take the suckers out because the tree was still alive. We just left them there to look at them and see what they look like. The next summer it comes along, we have a windstorm and the sucker snapped off. I mean, you know, it's like a self-pruning sucker, but that's a problem. Um, uh, but it tells us something else, all right? Uh, people at Cornell, Penn State, Cornell does it with uh, MRI type of stuff. Penn State did it the old fashioned way uh, with uh, just sort of taking uh, sections out of the trunks. And Brent, uh, Brent Black's working on it at Utah State. So this is something that's popped all over the country, all right? Uh, they've been looking at anatomical differences at the union and is there really a good connection there at the union? Uh, one of the nurserymen in Virginia comes up, he kind of agrees with me that the stocks themselves are brittle. Um, the shanks are brittle and sometimes people are finding them snapping off even when they're in the in the bundle, and so it's not just necessarily the union. So we don't know whether it's the rootstock, the union, or uh, both, and then if you throw a weak growing sign on top of it, you have real problems, all right? Other kinds of things that I'm trying to do to reduce uh, fire blight risk in Maryland orchards, I'll just give a, a brief thing and just mention to you. Uh, this year, uh, we're working towards getting Antietam blush out to a few of the, there's a couple people in the audience who Got like a bundle of 10 coming, something like that. One, two, three, four. Um, that's on hold and they're supposed to be coming from Adams County Nursery uh, and you'll all be billed for them, all right? All right. It don't, 
don't pay me, you pay Adam Scanley Nursery, all right? Uh, the other thing is, um, as many of you know, I've worked for a long time with Asian pears. Mike and I just got something in the Maryland Fruit Grower um, a few months ago on our work on Asian pears. Um, I really like Olympic, and that one turns out to be as fire blight resistant as Magnus in any of the trials we've done in the field. So uh, we're not just worried about apples, we're also worried about fire blight in all kinds of mixed orchard settings. So questions on this? You've all been listening very attentively, quietly. Questions? Any questions for Chris? Yes. Chris, um, a lot of these new varieties that are out now didn't originate from the country that came from the Far East. Right. right. Now, what are they doing with the fire bite and stuff there? It's not an issue where these came from. Okay. Um, the question is where we're getting new varieties from. We have actually. We are the center of origin for fire blight, so we've actually been exporting it to other parts of the world. All right? I remember when Steiner was alive and he told me that the Australians pre predicted where they would look for in Australia for fire blight. So, we, you, know, you know that Harry Kyle was breeding pears against fire blight years ago. Um, we've been much more attentive to doing that, but as we have gone to varieties that are precocious, they flower on one year wood. So if you look at Crips Pink, Gala, Pink Lady, uh, Crips Pink, Gala, Honeycrisp, they flower on one year wood. They have spur bloom, but they also bloom on, so it's more like a rat tail blooming pear. So what happens is they bloom later in the year. When you put them on a precocious rootstock, that keeps that bloom coming later in the year. The good news for apple growers last year was you got frosted out at the beginning of the year, but then the lateral bloom gave you a crop. You couldn't thin it, but it at least gave you a crop. Um, people have not been breeding against fire blight. Honeycrisp is susceptible, Fuji is susceptible, Gale is susceptible. Unfortunately, when we, when we took even varieties from North America, Gale and Fuji, that had delicious in the background that's resistant or tolerant, we got things, genes in there for, from other parts of the world that were actually susceptible. So we brought their material in. Fuji, it's got American parents, but it was selected in Japan. Um, Honeycrisp, they weren't breeding against fire. So essentially, we have made the varieties more precocious. So it doesn't matter so much where they're coming from. I think it's happened just as well in this country, too. We've selected for things. But, uh, and the, where, the place I really worry most about imported material, or not a, but new varieties, is the cider operations that are trying to put a lot of stuff in because that, those varieties are coming from an area where they've never been challenged for fire blight and some are susceptible and some are tolerant. And unfortunately, people are running experiments in their own orchards to figure it out. Good question though. Yes, sir. Uh, yep. After I stuck in my blood, my first Asian pear orchard, I cut them, I sprayed them, I burned them, the area comes back. But after I sold the orchard, they cut that everything except maybe two or three trees up front. And I tried by every year, and they don't seem to have any fireflies. Nobody taking care of them. What, was the, what were the trees in the front? Do you remember? One of them is a sin chewy. Okay, so they should get it. It should get it. Yeah. I think it's the lack of fertilizer. I mean, when we, we back off, one of the things that makes young apple trees or young pear trees more susceptible is we're really trying to grow them fast. So we put a lot of nitrogen on them. When you stop pruning them, you stop fertilizing them, the nitrogen level's going down they're probably less susceptible because they're lower fertilizer. A lot of people are using um, Apogee to reduce the shoot length in pears and apples to get them to form terminal buds faster. That also slows down the, the, the shoot blight. So I think it's, when you have a really vigorous tree, the same variety is more susceptible. When you stop managing it, it becomes less susceptible. Sorry. We, unfortunately, we have to grow them vigorously. Mr. Moore. Chris, 
uh, enjoyed your talk. Um, Sit down. Right? We started with uh, 40 by 40 apples back in the 40s, right? No, no, it's just in the 80s or whatever. So now we're, now we're down to 3 by 12. So we went, so we went to this huge tree, down to a small tree to make it user friendly. Now we're just back to a huge tree that's just packed in tight. And you still have to be huge in the sense you still got to have a mechanical uh, assist to get to the top. Of the tree. Right. Well, we. we we wanted to make it fit our, our size. We, as we dropped it down, if you do the, the volume of a cone, right, it depends a lot on the height of that cone. And so when you bring it down to eight feet, your volume is relatively small. So what we've done is we pushed them back up again, and now people are using picking platforms to go through the orchard and stuff like that. 12 feet is not good for pick your own. I mean, you, and so, you're throwing about, if you're going on eight feet, you're probably throwing about 30% of yield away because you can't get it. Is that kind of? And, and I, I guess in, in urban, urban Maryland, I would right. think growers would tend towards retail rather than wholesale. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so to me, a 12-foot tree does not have any yeah. retail. No, a 12-foot tree, it's, it's a wholesale deal. The other deal is that was unspoken here is the people who are doing this are looking to get that early return on the children of Honeycrisp that are the new varieties that are coming on um, and they're in the club varieties and things like that but if you get frosted out or if you lose trees you can't pay the bank back for the for the loan that's what worries me yes are these apples all just for eating this is everything I talked about these are all fresh market apples yes um, we have still a lot of people with older trees that are York type of varieties or processed varieties, but the Honeycrisp has been so valuable for wholesale or retail. I mean, retail in the supermarkets around here is $3.99 a pound. Wholesale was $40 a bushel in September, so it's pretty good. How much time do I have? Because I, don't, I think I've taken it all, right? Well, 10 minutes, no questions, though. What? So you have 10 minutes left with no time for questions. So would you rather do more questions or talk about fruit maturity and quality? Mr. Moore. Yes, ma'am. Uh, may I ask you about heritage apples? How do they react to fire blight? Are they immune or not? I would think that in general, heritage apples would be more tolerant, but there's always an exception to the rule. Uh, Fuji, which is, um, Jerry, do you remember the Fuji cross? It's um, Red Delicious by Rawls-Janet. Rawls-Janet Rawls -Janet was uh, grown by Thomas Jefferson, right? Um, it has got a, an American, two American varieties as parents. Delicious is feel tolerant to fire blight. Rawls would be a heritage variety. I fear that the heritage varieties, along with the cider varieties, are very, very, some of them are going to be susceptible and some are going to be resistant. Because a lot of the older heritage varieties were selected for going into cider. They weren't necessarily selected for going, for, they weren't bitters, that kind of cider, but just for alcohol production. Um, so some of those old varieties, and some of them may actually go back and have genetics from England, where they're a seedling of, a, of, an, uh, of an English variety. So I, I think it's all over the board. I've never seen, I don't know the data on that. Jerry, do you have a better answer to the question than I've got on that? What was the question? Heritage varieties and fire blight susceptibility. Better, worse, the same as what we're dealing with now? It's hard to say. Test right. We didn't have fire blight. Well, I was just wondering if you'd visited Saunders Brothers down in, in Nelson County because Bennett was very interested in heritage varieties from Virginia and if, if he had any tip, a lot of young trees. tips. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think anybody knows because it wasn't, it was first identified in Connecticut, God, two, 150 or 200 years ago. Yes, sir. Right. 
doesn't go any further. Uh, wines have on the other hand, I hardly ever see a strike in the wines. Mm -hmm. Well, reds and goldens are both seedlings of American old varieties. I mean, they're, they're both from here. That's why we grew so many of them. So I think there's probably a pool of genetic resistance, but to say that they're all resistant is, is you know, it, it, the problem is as we go to the rootstocks that make the plants flower more, and we go to more precocious varieties, you have, on apple, you can grow flowers on one-year wood, or you can grow it on two, three, and four-year-old wood with a little fruit spurs. The fruit spurs bloom first, so it's still cooler weather, so they avoid fire blight. The later bloom that comes on the lateral wood is more susceptible. As we bred more precocious varieties, we've made the opportunity for infection. Um, is how, I don't know how quickly you can go through these slides, or do you want I'll to? I'll go or? pretty quick. Okay. Go. I'll go pretty quick. Got it. Um, I got a couple things on new apple varieties here, and I'll just, uh, I got funded about $7,000 last year by uh, State Horde of Pennsylvania to do some stuff on maturity. We put it out in fruit times. Anybody see that last fall? Anybody read it? A few people did. All right. Um, and when we get new varieties, one of the big questions is when do we pick them? And also, although climate change is not happening, according to the government, uh, I kind of believe it is, all right? And I operate on this hypothesis for maturity. For apples, the idea, the driver for maturity and ripening is the apples create their own ethylene. Ethylene is a, some people call it the ripening hormone. When you get green bananas, they come in from Central America, they hit them with ethylene in Wilmington or Philadelphia, in Port of Wilmington, and that ripens the bananas, okay? Um, on an apple, it happens on the tree. The apple starts to make ethylene. That affects firmness, it affects color, it affects starch, and sugar to acid ratio. Uh, the old way of looking at firmness was color chips. There are newer ways of doing it that are measuring the chlorophyll non-destructively in the peel. Other things that can be done for uh, maturity are to look at, this is the Cornell starch test. The problem with it is it's time consuming, it's slow, people don't always have things that agree with the bottom line, and uh, it's also counterintuitive. What do I mean by that? A score of one is a lot of starch where it's blue, a score of eight, which is a higher score, has no starch whatsoever in it. So that blue stain tells you how much starch is left in the fruit. Okay, we did a couple of maturity objectives and we put them out in fruit times. We worked on uh, high, tall spindle trees in Pennsylvania and Maryland. Uh, this is what we looked at. Uh, we started the season in Pennsylvania with Premier Honey Crisp. That was at 1,200 feet elevation, we picked those around the 10th of August. Uh, we did Honeycrisp from Pennsylvania and Maryland, Brookfield, Gala, Crimson Crisp, and then three different selections of Fuji, uh, the final one being Crips Pink. This is my lab in College Park. Uh, just to give you an idea of the difference between Honeycrisp, which is the one that put you through school, all right? Uh, this was mid-August, and uh, we'd pick these on the same day, same orchard. This is regular Honeycrisp here. That's Premier over there. Uh, in the back, we've got Brookfield Gala. So the Premier Honeycrisp was actually this one here, regular Honeycrisp, that one there. So it's all blue, full of starch, mm. no color. The one in the middle is Brookfield Gala. So what does that tell us? Premier Honeycrisp is three weeks ahead of regular Honeycrisp if you want an apple the second week in August. And the other thing is, it is ahead of Gala. All right. Um, early varieties. Another thing that popped was uh, Daybreak Fuji. Anybody grow Daybreak Fuji? One, two, same farm. That's not count. You only get one vote. Um, that does remarkably well. Uh, September 20th Fuji does remarkably well. Um, it ripens ahead of a mid, uh, early mid-season variety, Crimson Crisp, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, Daybreak Fuji, they were better than any of the Fujis we had on the farm this summer. I was amazed. That was about September 20th. Uh, Crimson Crisp, 
which is a disease resistant uh, North American variety from the PRI program. That's crimson crisp there, there's the surface color, there's the starch staining pattern. Here we've got Daybreak Fuji in the middle, right? No starch left in it on September 20th. Here we've got uh, Nagafu Fuji on the right. You can see some starch is gone. They're still a long way away from being harvested, however. Those were eating ripe on September 20th. How long did it take you to pick them? One weekend? About two hours. About two hours? Yeah, one day. Yeah, one day. They, the customers ate them, though. They took them, right? It's really amazing. Uh, Crimson Crisp, pretty apple. I don't know if you can see the, the color here. Uh, I would like to say that Crimson Crisp does not have that I'm aware of Honeycrisp in its parentage uh, that I'm aware of. I could not find any Honeycrisp in it and other people I talked to said the same thing. One of the interesting things we found is tremendous amount of water core this year, right? Uh, it made them very tasty, but they were 25 pounds. They were the hardest apple I've ever done in fruit maturity. They're not necessarily crisp. They are rock hard. <laughs> Pardon? Got to eat them with a knife. Got to eat them with a knife. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, I, I, I talked one time years ago, and, and uh, I was talking about people buying a lot of Granny Smith, and one of the crusty old guys in the audience, I said, do you know why that is? And he goes, yeah, because they got all their teeth. You know? <laughs> so uh, at any rate, here's sort of the late variety summary. Uh, Crips was mature about a week ahead of what it would have been the year before that. Um, we have... We have pretty good uh, luck getting things done pretty quickly in, in Maryland, uh, getting a lot of stuff in that September and October window. One of the things that a lot of you would have had this year was problem with the peel on Fuji. This is russet from spring cold weather. This is, we had a lot of sunburn on Fujis, and that sunburned area does not turn red. Those cells have been damaged to the point where the Fujis just never turned. They stayed green all through October. Crips, on the other hand, didn't sunburn, right? And we had some, this was the first week in October at Keatesville. Crips looked pretty good. Uh, at the beginning of October, Crips are full of starch. By the end of October, four weeks later, before Halloween, there's enough starch out of them. They're about 16 degrees bricks. People will eat them. Uh, they're edible. They're soft enough. Uh, they can make it. So here we've got two Fujis here at the end, last week in October, and here we've got Crips next to them, all right? The other thing we're interested in is what can you do on maturity on Honeycrisp to minimize storage disorders? Now, most people don't store apples in this group, but in Western Maryland and Southern Pennsylvania, there's a lot of storage going on. And what happens is if you pick green Honeycrisp, they bitter pit. If you pick riper Honeycrisp, they get something called soft scald, all right? The peel is damaged, but you can actually put your finger into them, all right? So what we did is we used uh, non-destructive measures to segregate fruits out. We did a once-over harvest on the whole tree. We segregated them on ground color, uh, used this machine to segregate them, and we took the green ones up here and brought them out of storage in the middle of January. They were firmer and they were sweeter. As they went into, this was okay. This was Robert Prang's sweet spot right in there. Oddly enough, these two matched up almost identically. And if they were tree ripe when we picked them, guess what? They didn't store very well. No surprise there. We also looked at peel browning. And we didn't get any bitter pit, but we looked at peel browning. And that was Robert Prang's sweet spot. This is Premier Honeycrisp, which nobody would soar but 120 days, because they'd be gone by the 1st of September. Um, again, Prang might be right. There might be a sweet spot even here in Appalachia Forest. We didn't get any bitter pit. You pick green Honeycrisp, you get bitter pit. That's a calcium deficiency. Why didn't we get it? All the orchards in the Honeycrisp site were using liquid calcium, and they were using it religiously uh, during the growing season. All right, so that was our third objective that was post-harvest. And these are the acknowledgments. A lot of people propped me up and made me look good on this one. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. If you want to talk about some of this afterwards, I'll be around. <laughs>